Chapter 2 of A Water Biography by Robert C. Leslie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 2 I am in danger of drifting into art. My cousin goes to sea, is proud of his ship. We go and look at her and meet his captain. I narrowly escape becoming a naval architect. Interview Sir William Simons. His answer. Make a second voyage to America. Learn a little navigation at sea in sailing ships, a hungry crew, icebergs, arrive in New York, visit Baltimore, an early twin screw boat, see Niagara, take a shower bath under it, return to London, get hopelessly involved in art, Become a student at the R.A. Work there? A sailor's view of the sea, not the popular one. Another trip to New York and back. A winter passage. Ship pooped. Wheel takes charge. Getting down royal yards. Thirty days of vingt et un. Hard a port, a near shave, cod fishermen on the banks, their risks, force of wind, a deck hatch in the air, a calm after a gale. How I calculated ship's angle of heel, the captain's joke, return trip of the Hendrick Hudson. How my cousin saw the last of her. It is a curious fact that, though on whatever part of earth I may find myself, I have always selected the first and steepest downhill road, which, steadily followed, surely ends in a river bank or the seashore that about this period the watery tide of my biography showed signs of ebbing, and left me for a time aground among the enervating shoals and mud-banks of an artistic career. This was just after I lost the companionship of my sturdy, blue-coated cousin, whose true love of the sea now led to an honest apprenticeship to the captain of a smart little clipper bark of four hundred tons, bound round Cape Horn for certain Pacific ports. She lay in the London docks, and had real gun ports and carronades on a flush upper deck. My cousin was immensely proud of this, his first ship, and before joining her, as they say in the Navy, took me down with him to the docks, just to see what a beauty she was, where we were met by his burly skipper with, Look here, Mr. B., I can't have you a dancing aboard my ship in the garb of a gentleman with your friends, and ands in your pockets. I want you aboard here with me, with your ands in the slush and tarpots. After which seamanlike snub, the skipper turned on his heel, and my cousin and I left him alone in his glory, pacing the after-deck of his ship. My own desultory education, which was drawing to a close, was now followed by an attempt to obtain a berth as naval draftsman in a government yard. 
with a view to which I received, through a friend of my father, an introduction to Sir William Simons, then surveyor of the navy, who at once politely told me that appointments of that kind were all strictly reserved for relatives of those who had held similar births for generations, adding that to give one to an outsider, even if it were to be his own nephew, would bring a hornet's nest about his ears. Many a time since then have I blessed Sir William, or, I should say, the good old conservatism of his department. For had I unluckily got that berth, I must certainly have lost what wits I ever had in striving to solve that hopeless problem, the design of a modern ironclad which should fulfill a fourth part of the conditions required of her. Sir William Simons was the last of our real old sea-going and sea-keeping ship designers and it must have been hard lines for him to see his noble fleet of sailing cruisers converted one after another into bad screw-steamers, or raised down to mere harbor defense ships, just when he had reduced the art of naval construction to a system, in which each class of vessel, from a revenue cutter upward, was to be as permanent in type as the specimens in a case of butterflies. It was in 1841, as I continued to busy myself in the study and construction of models of ships and boats, both on paper and in other material, that a friend gave me a passage on board a ship of which he was part owner and captain this voyage was made chiefly with a view to a look at the shipbuilding yards of New York, Boston, Philadelphia, and Baltimore. And thus I found myself one bright morning afloat in a fine new American ship, bound for New York, with nothing to do and plenty of time to do it in. I was now old enough, however, to pick up some knowledge of handling a square-rigged ship, and under the practical instruction of her captain, to take and work out from an observation the latitude and longitude. Not, as he said, that I was likely to ever want such knowledge, but that it was a good thing to know the reason why of anything. A westward voyage from London to New York was then rarely made even by the smartest sailing ship in less than thirty days, while five or six weeks was not considered a long passage. But so far as I was concerned, a headwind or a flat calm with the ship building a chapel or slowly heading round all the points of the compass, was a gain. I had my sketch-book to fall back on, and to me it mattered nothing when day after day our packet was bounding over head seas, with head north-north-west on one tack and south-south-west on the other. On board a sailing vessel, indeed, life at sea is seldom long of a monotonous character, especially in the North Atlantic, where more than one day of calm is rare. Continual change in the strength and direction of the wind entails frequent trimming of yards and taking in or shaking out reefs, and when after standing for a few days on one tack, the wind draws more and more ahead. There is quite a bustle on deck at the word, Call the watch to tack ship! 
after which the long steady heel of everything over to port is changed for a list to starboard and when this occurs at night all those below in a thwartship bunks find themselves with their heels higher than their heads unless they rouse out and shift end for end at the same time unfastened cabin doors on the lee side all fly open and those on the weather side shut with a bang and remain obstinately closed with one or two heavy pieces of loose baggage piled against them we had a pleasant and uneventful passage one calm day was spent rolling in the company of a small bark until as the two vessels drew nearer and nearer together a small speck of a boat was lowered from her manned by four swarthy-looking fellows who pulled alongside our ship and begged for a bag of potatoes and a little fresh biscuit they were ninety days out from calcutta as we neared the banks of newfoundland we spent another calm day in the company of several large steep islands of ice and some small cod fishing schooners soon after which about two hundred miles from sandy hook we fell in with a brightly painted white red and green pilot schooner out of which we took a dapper-looking little man who handed about among the passengers some new york papers about a week old together with the news that the yellow flag was up in many streets on account of smallpox after we got inside sandy hook our handy little ship was accompanied by a squat shaped tug but as the wind was fair she did not require her assistance and only clewed up her main and four topsails just before she glided into her berth alongside of peck's slip at the bottom of number something street there i left my friend and his ship and while she was unloading and lading again for london i spent some weeks among the shipping ports of the eastern states american shipping and wooden shipbuilding was at that time making rapid strides and all the slips between the wooden jetties round east and north rivers were full of smart-looking square-yarded sailing craft bound to all parts of the world iron had not yet entered the soul of oak elm and hemp the great western and a few other english cunard paddle-boats had it is true begun to interfere in the passenger trade on board the old sailing liners and as my friend the packet captain said you might get a cross in one but if you wanted to make sure you'd better take your passage in one of his ships the most interesting american port to me was baltimore in going there from philadelphia a night was spent on board a canal boat or steamer fitted with twin propellers under each quarter after the fashion of our modern battleships her two little screws being driven by an old railway or as the yankees called it a locomotive engine we crossed the upper part of chesapeake bay in her and i shall never forget the night in her narrow crowded cabin which though little over six feet high was a three-decker as to tiers of temporary sleeping shelves or how when these were all rapidly stowed away 
in the morning her passengers disposed of a breakfast of fried pig's liver and sausages supplied to them at an almost nominal price baltimore was then the headquarters of the builders of fast schooners some of which were still engaged in trade between american southern ports and the west coast of africa and i see that the round spoon-shaped bow of these baltimore clippers has been revived in several modern racing yachts i was of course not allowed to leave the states without making a pilgrimage to niagara it was then a long steamboat and railway journey of four days or more the pace of the train never exceeding sixteen miles an hour the line cut through a narrow lane between the primeval forest the tall bare stems standing in dank boggy ground so thickly that there was hardly room to swing an axe among them while even the few improved lots were cumbered with stumps three or four feet high round and among which the plough had to be driven on the canadian shore of the falls the celebrated table rock had not yet fallen and i made a sketch of the great horseshoe fall from it the vibration of this overhanging shelf felt exactly like that on the after-deck of a fast screw steamer near it a spiral wooden stair built round the tall stem of a great fir tree led down to the cave of the winds and from there by means of a narrow ledge cut in the rock one could pass two hundred feet or more behind the horseshoe fall this was something more than a damp expedition and a bathing suit and sou'wester were put on before undertaking it in the company of a negro guide i do not know whether the fall of table rock has since altered or interfered with this pathway behind the fall but in those days a certificate to the effect that he or she had stood two hundred feet behind the great fall was always given on first entering the passage one had to keep the head bent to avoid being blinded by the heavy shower of spray but toward the end of it there was little of this so that i was able to look up and admire the thick sheet of amber water as it shot out from the black shelf of rock overhead twenty or more feet in front of one and rush down until pounded into a mass of foam among enormous blocks of rock eighty feet below the ledge we stood upon on my arrival in london upon the return voyage certain sketches made at sea were thought too much of and led in those good old easy days of art to my drifting into it born and brought up among pictures and the smell of the painting-room i scarcely recollect the time when i first began to handle a brush but lest i might become prematurely dexterous in the handicraft of a painter i now entered as student at the r a where under the casual and gentlemanly supervision of the keeper jones r a i began to slowly acquire the art of stippling with italian chalk and bread-crumb studies from the antique it took about an hour to reach trafalgar square 
and by the time I had entrenched myself behind an academy board and successfully returned a fire of bread pellets from fellow students and got rather more than a square inch done of one of these antique studies, it was time to pack up my traps and walk home again. These episodes of art study have, however, no place in a water biography, and long before I had made any attempt to rise above them into what is known as the life, I was temporarily rescued from them by my friend the Yankee skipper with another offer of a voyage to New York and back. On looking back upon this part of my artistic life, I fear that though, like Turner, born a cockney, I was not born an artist. I never took much pleasure in art, except as a means of recording incidents at sea, which, though of interest to seafaring men, had little or no pictorial value. The sailor's view of the sea and ships has never been the popular one, and judged by my own experience, even members of the R.A. do not always care for technical accuracy in marine painting, while their public delights more in the sea as seen from the foreshores of a seaside watering place than from the deck of a ship. In my various trips across the Atlantic, I had plenty of splendid opportunities of studying the dark, ink-like waves of the North Atlantic, and in many shorter ones between London and Spithead in the same vessels, the greener seas and moving ship life of the Channel. Ever since the song of As We Lay, all that day, etc., was written, or when our frigates cruised for months at a time blockading the French, summer and winter, in the Bay of Biscay, the sea there has been credited with or expected to play terrible freaks in that corner of the western ocean, while equinoctial gales have quite a proverbial reputation. But among the old Atlantic packet captains, the dreaded bay was merely regarded as a sample of any part of the North Atlantic, taken at random between the chops of the channel and Sandy Hook. While as to equinoctial gales, these old salts stuck to it that no bad weather meant by them compared with that of the three winter months of December, January, and February. And one of these winter passages I was at this time lucky enough to fall in with on board the good ship Hendrick Hudson, in which I left New York November 21st, 1842. She was in charge of a very smart young captain on his first voyage as skipper. The old man, by which name her former captain, my friend of forty, was known, staying to hum with his family for the winter. He was, however, part owner, and on going over the ship's side into the tender at Sandy Hook, wished his mate a pleasant voyage, adding, Take care of yourselves, you're deep as a sand barge, which was true, for eighteen feet draft left but five feet freeboard. We started in light easterly headwinds and wet gloomy weather, which on nearing the banks suddenly backed in squalls of rain to southwest. Yards were at once squared, and under double reef topsails and foresail, we were soon making twelve knots on an easterly course for London town. 
day after day the same fair gale followed the ship varying a trifle in direction but always increasing in strength until sail was reduced to a close reefed fore topsail and fore topmast staysail under which we were still able to stagger along with our head to the eastward each day however the following seas grew bigger as the increasing wind howled louder through the naked rigging until now and again one threatened to overtake us owing to the fore topsail being becalmed by a sea towering astern so that for a moment in spite of four good men at her wheel the ship would lose steerage way everything however held on well and the young captain rejoiced as he reckoned upon having made over eight hundred miles in four days under that straining strip of canvas but on the evening of the fourth day with a heavy thud aft a larger sea than usual did really overtake us and splitting two stern deadlights poured six inches deep through the poop cabin knocking down at the same time the men at the wheel while at once as sailors say took charge the captain and mate were the first to grapple and arrest that madly spinning helm and just save their ship from slewing broadside to the gale or as it is called broaching too after which in spite of his fair wind our skipper guessed he'd heave too and before midnight succeeded in doing so under a main trysail though we had to man the capstan on the poop and take the lee trysail sheet to it before he could get it aft this weather continued with a few hours lull between each gale until near the english coast so that we counted eight gales in three weeks soon after the first of these gales a man was missing though how or when lost was never known the ship was not overmanned and her crew had become so fagged out with double shifts at the wheel spells at the pumps and illness that out of twenty-five all told they now only mustered fifteen fit for work aloft and with all available hands on the yard including the mate and carpenter one topsail only could be furled or reefed at a time packet ship fashion our royal yards remained aloft until the weather became almost too bad to send them down and when in a lull between two gales our skipper sent two of his strongest youngsters up the fore and main to gallant mass with this object the excitement on deck as to the fate of one of them was for some time considerable the fore royal yard was sent down all right in spite of the heavy rolling of the ship but the lad on the mainmast by some mischance lost control of his yard which then as it swung to and fro from the yard rope threatened every moment either to break his legs or knock him off the tagallant mast to which he clung by them until at last his skipper in a voice like a watchman's rattle fairly yelled at him to come down by the tagallant backstay he was too good a hand however to give in even to the swearing commands of his captain if indeed he clearly heard them where he was and after many unsuccessful efforts and risk of life and limb 
he at last secured his yard and sent it down safely on deck. We had among our passengers an old traveler who had crossed the Atlantic twenty-seven times under canvas, and his remarks to our skipper on this occasion, also when pooped by the sea, were not complimentary. We had ten cabin passengers, all men, who passed most of their time below playing vingt et un by lamplight, the skylights being battened down, and the words, I stand, double all around, pay up, became terribly monotonous. But I remember how, on a dark moonless night, when running before one of the strongest gales, a loud quick shout on deck of, Port, port, hard a port! startled even this group of players most of whom knew that such an order when scudding before a heavy sea in mid-atlantic meant something in the way even the eternal double all around was hushed for a moment as the card players paused and listened for the next order none came however and I was alongside the captain on deck, just as a huge black phantom tore past us and disappeared in the darkness astern, our captain waving his binnacle lantern over our rail in answer to a feeble spark of light frantically waving to and fro on the deck of the other vessel. I guess that was close enough, Bob, was all the captain said, adding, A miss is as good as a mile. Did you see her? I made her out to be bark-rigged, hove to under a close reef topsail. Ships then carried no lights, and at any risk we, being before the wind, were bound to keep clear of a ship hove to. Though had we gone over her, it is not likely that a collision that night would have been followed by a trial at law. In the long dark winter nights, low deep vessels like ours must have often crossed one another's course within hail without seeing anything of each other especially when the seas between them were big enough to hide a ship halfway up her topmast rigging. While on the banks we constantly ran close by small cod fishermen, mostly French, hove to under a scrap of storm trysail one such we passed in daylight near enough to look down upon her low deck as she lay like a duck in the hollow of a sea there was not a soul on watch on her deck and this gave rise to a yarn of how a liverpool packet must have run clean over one of these schooners at night and only discovered it in the morning by finding a small scrap of her upper rigging hanging about the ship's jib-boom. When running before it, the strength of the gusts in a gale are hard to measure. But in one of the hardest of these blows, the skipper and I nearly came to grief by being knocked on the head by a heavy hatch, or covering of the wheelhouse aft which was lifted into the air by the wind and carried forward just clear of our heads to the break of the poop where we stood holding on to the rail it struck the deck between us and cutting a large splinter out of it bounded over into the waist below the kick-up of the ship's stern on a sea helped the wind no doubt to lift this piece of stout woodwork 
which was eight feet long by four feet wide and fourteen inches high above the wheelhouse deck under which the men steered it was a strong made hatch and so securely fitted over a deep ledge or combing on the deck that it had never been known to move before even when the ship was pooped by the sea the short sudden spells of calm between each breeze often gave far more trouble than the gales because continued bad weather had so strained and stretched our nearly new rigging that when for want of steerage way the ship fell broadside into the trough of the sea she threatened to roll her masts overboard all that could be done under the circumstances to help the slackened shrouds was to cat-harpen them by means of capstan bars lashed across below the futtock shrouds and get a strain with a tackle upon ropes passed across between these bars from one set of shrouds to the other preventer backstays were also rigged to support the topmasts but in a heavy rolling ship these operations were not easily carried out it being difficult to get about or even stand on deck without holding on or taking a turn of rope round one the captain's joke on me at these times was that my length six foot two and a half inches did away with all risk of falling overboard i might as he said veer or pay myself over but there would be always plenty of time to take a turn of me round something before i left the ship altogether no doubt this was a very funny joke because like judges jokes those made by captains are always funny besides it was made one day when owing to the ship's angle of heel i found myself dangling from the rail with both feet clear of her deck another source of anxiety after a spell of heavy rolling was our cargo of raw turpentine the big flimsy casks in which it was stowed working one against another until quantities of the viscid stuff oozed out of them into the ship's bilges and choked the pumps which as we wanted pumping at least a quarter of an hour each watch had to be lifted several times during the voyage to clear them of it and so after all in spite of strong and often fair gales the voyage was a long one for after making the land we had baffling winds up channel and it was two days after christmas day before we hauled into dock we had lost a man and all our bulwarks on the port side between the poop and forecastle. i met that young skipper in london on his return trip in spring and he said yes i guess that was a rough time but you ought to have made the westerly trip back with us in january when we were seventy days from the downs to sandy hook and when after beating down channel to the lizard with a cow's pilot on board the weather being too rough to land him we fell in with a gale and after lying to first on one tack and then the other for a week drove back to the downs the hendrick hudson was built at new york in eighteen forty one in eighty-nine days and launched ready for sea with spars etc all standing 
she foundered in mid-atlantic with a cargo of rails thirteen years afterwards my blue coat boy cousin being then first mate all hands took to the boats and were picked up by a passing vessel and as my cousin said that was the last i saw of the old hendrick hudson end of chapter two